there was some technical error uh, there in where uh, the meeting uh, you know there was some wrong uh, date which was there for the meeting id some technical issues were there and uh, therefore we had to change it you know all of a sudden right now but i guess we have been able to spread the message to everyone and uh, people are joining us as people are joining us uh, we're just waiting for some more time to people you know for people to join in smoothly so that everyone can get benefit out of this webinar no one misses this whole thing you want to start slowly i, I think i think yes so we should start now because uh, the message also yeah. takes time to spread to people but anyways yeah. people are able to see us on youtube live so that's that's okay i think we should start now okay uh, yeah hello everyone out there uh, warm welcome to you sorry for the delay in this whole thing because of the technical issues a uh, very good morning to all of you i welcome you all here today into this conversation on an approach to shoulder pain uh, with me and dr nagra shetty uh, for those who don't know me i'm dr priyank kolcha i'm a physiotherapist specialized in orthopedics and manual therapy and i did my one of the certifications in kinetic control movement therapy from london i run my own uh, tutorial named as insight tutorial uh with the aim to educate people you know the general population also about physiotherapy about a healthy lifestyle which they should pursue and also to share my knowledge with my fellow colleagues um practicing in mumbai for those who are outside mumbai and those who don't know me i'm practicing in mumbai and seeing all kinds of orthopedic cases sports injuries and uh, for enhancement of sports performance also So I'm pleased today that uh, Insight Tutorial is pleased to have with us Dr. Nagra Shetty with us today. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for giving uh, your time and for agreeing for this conversation. Uh, people in Mumbai very well know him, and uh, those outside, I just want to give you a brief uh, introduction of Dr. Nagra Shetty. Uh, Dr. Nagra Shetty has an expertise in all kind of orthopedic uh, joint uh, problems like uh, knee, shoulder. and uh, he has done his advanced fellowship trainings from centers of excellence in spain italy as well as south korea netherlands and uh, so uh, not only he uh, sees the patients in mumbai but also in surat nashik pune as well Uh, so uh, you know we should uh, try to utilize the uh, time to its maximum and to take his uh, you know uh, uh, expertise on the various queries which we have today now for all the audiences out there i just want to say one thing there's an input there's a piece of information for all of you this whole conversation is divided into two parts the first half is there for the general population uh, for the layman uh, to uh, you know understand about the few of the uh, problems which are you know we generally face and uh, that's like uh, me and dr naga shetty would be conversing discussing on few of the things which we thought that uh, you know commonly the people have query about and uh, the second half of it would be for the medical fraternity and it would be more of a technical stuff so if you know the layman or the general population wants to leave by then they may do so so the first half would be there for around 25 to 30 minutes 
once me and Dr. Nagraj are done with our conversation and our discussion, you can uh, ask your questions. You can raise your hand and ask your questions on Zoom. You can chat on the YouTube and uh, you know you can type in the chat box in YouTube and you can ask there as well. So uh, that uh, you know whether we can get maximum out of it. I guess we have less time right now. We just have half an hour, so we will try our best to you know possibly cover the things but yes if there is something which is not being taken care of which is not being covered or if we are not able to answer you on certain things you could mail us on our mail id which is already being given of inside tutorial also and uh, yes thereafter if you know if any queries are left unanswered we could cover them Okay, uh, I welcome you again, Dr. Nagra Shetty. Uh, thank you so right. much for uh, joining in today. And it would be my pleasure to uh, converse with you on certain topics, which I feel uh, we should uh, discuss in detail. So uh, first thing, first thing which is there in my mind is uh, it always there from long time about frozen shoulder, you know, the, uh, this whole uh, label of frozen shoulder, which is there. In my clinical practice, I have been seeing people coming quite often with this label, with this diagnosis. Sometimes, you know, a self-diagnosis of frozen shoulder. And when we go to examine, we don't find it as a frozen shoulder, frozen shoulder per se. We feel that, you know, there are other things which are there, maybe a tear or, you know, uh, some other kind of diagnosis which is being attached. Okay, so I had wanted people to get clarity on this, to be clear about it so that they can uh, get themselves treated uh, in a better way, not label all the shoulder pathologies easily into frozen shoulder. And the way I have been seeing it, you know, the way people have been coming up with this label, uh, Dr. Nagraj, what, what do you feel? Is it so much prevalent uh, uh, that, you know, it's, is it so much prevalent that uh, people will get very easily a frozen shoulder what is the prevalence and what do you think are the risk factors associated with it? Who are the people who are at risk of uh, getting a frozen shoulder, frozen shoulder per se? So your question has got roughly three parts. Uh, I'll talk about each part separately. So the first part is about the confusion in the general population as to what is frozen shoulder and whether uh, that's the most common diagnosis. Uh, the answer is no, it's not the most common diagnosis because most often than not, it is wrongly diagnosed as frozen shoulder. So for the general population, this answer is for the general population. Okay. Frozen shoulder basically means that your shoulder is not only painful, but also stiff. So if you have only pain in the shoulder, but your movements are good, movements are fine. That is a very basic line for you to understand that you're most likely not going to have frozen shoulder. As far as the prevalence is concerned, the minute out of 10 pathologies, which are painful in the shoulder, if we rule out the ones which are painful and stiff, the prevalence automatically goes down. So true frozen shoulder, where there is... Uh, uh, stiffness and pain in the shoulder without any major uh, pre-existent uh, mechanical problems in the shoulder. This true uh, definition of frozen shoulder is not so common. Uh, uh, shoulder has got various other reasons for pain to develop, which your treating doctor will uh, guide you ahead. So the minute you have shoulder trouble, if some uh, doctor has told you have got frozen shoulder, do not get alarmed. Because for all you know, it might not be true frozen shoulder. As far as the risk factors are concerned, this is a common question which patients ask. Uh, there are only few known risk factors for true frozen shoulder and they are the common metabolic disorders like diabetes, mellitus and hypothyroidism. Because in these endocrinal disorders, the patients will have an abnormal collagen structure and the shoulder collagen or rather the shoulder capsule is very sensitive to these uh, metabolic uh, changes happening in the body. And therefore, it goes into a swelling phase and the patient develops this sort of excruciating pain. Once the pain develops, the shoulder reacts with stiffness. So this is for the general population. To summarize, frozen shoulder is most often misdiagnosed. It is not as common as we think because frozen shoulder is pure stiffness of the shoulder without any internal mechanical problem. And the common risk factors are endocrinal disorders. So anybody who has been diagnosed with this should get their sugar levels at least and thyroid evaluated because it's quite common. However, more than 60% will not have these endocrine problems. It can happen idiopathic without reason. I hope I've answered that question. 
Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, and, uh, you know, uh, in my clinical practice, I've seen people, you know, coming and telling. I'm sharing it with everyone so that everyone is aware about it. Uh, like, you know, I had three days of pain in my shoulder and it got vanished. Can it be frozen shoulder? So it doesn't, frozen shoulder doesn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, get better on its own in three days uh, it cannot be given a label of frozen shoulder if your fro uh, shoulder uh, was like the shoulder pain which you had it was fine in three days that cannot be there there are so many things associated uh, with it yeah so uh, this is one of the things which uh, I felt we should uh, talk about uh, if you have any queries uh, to the people listening out to us out there if you have any queries you could uh, ask us later now, uh, there's uh, really, uh, right now, right now in the current scenario, we all are homebound. Uh, we are not uh, getting the household help also. Uh, to, most of us, like the maids are not coming and people have to work on their own. Uh, I'm concerned about, you know, the elderly people who are on their own right now and, uh, you know, they could be uh, doing extra work at home maybe some cleaning or you know uh, going and uh, you know that extra work extra load is there okay yes. and i feel i i really feel for elderly it is uh, very easy for them to get shoulder pain when they do overhead activities or yes. uh, you know so uh, yeah uh, this is one of the things which i want everybody to know and uh, uh, i even want you to uh, discuss about it like uh, uh, what is your say in this? So yeah, that's a very good uh, uh, discussion point. And uh, for all those elderly or even for that matter, uh, homebound uh, uh, women and men who are involved in overhead activity and excessive shoulder uh, work, we need to understand that uh, the reason that we don't have shoulder trouble today, as on today, doesn't mean we don't have a shoulder pathology. Okay. So there, there are a lot of pathologies in the shoulder which the body is compensating well. And if you decompensate it by overstressing your shoulder, this compensated mechanism will get damaged. So in the elderly, the common things which are which age affects is the rotator cuff and the joint cartilage. The joint cartilage is not as commonly affected as the knee and the spine, but yes, that is also affected. So these are the two problems of age. That is the degenerative changes happening in the shoulder are related to the rotator cuff, which is the important uh, gen uh, generator of strength in the shoulder and the cartilage. So there is already a pre-existent damage. In fact, you will be surprised, and this is for the knowledge of the general population, that you can have a complete tear of the rotator cuff and it would be painless and you would have good shoulder strength. And the incidence can be as high as 30 to 40% in anybody who's above 60 or 65. So that means you'll have, if you take 10 people who are above 65 and you evaluate them, you investigate them with an ultrasound or an MRI, they'll actually have a rotator cuff tear in the absence of any symptoms. Considering this, uh, it is important to understand that avoid any stressful activities of the shoulder. What are they? Overhead activity, trying to do things right above your face level, trying to lift heavy weights, trying to do jerky activities like taking your dog out for a walk and if there is a sudden pull by the dog or if there is a sudden jerk because of the door, these sort of uh, activities should be avoided because the sudden jerk can decompensate that already damaged rotator cuff. So this is for the elderly and for the young uh, population who are working from home, who are working on your laptops, it's very important to understand that you've got very good ergonomics. Now, what it means is that you should not have a drooping posture, which is likely to happen when you work for hours together. So you should make sure that you have an upright posture and your neck, your upper back and your scapulae are well strengthened, which physiotherapists like Dr. Priyank, etc. will guide you with the various exercises. But the take-home message is to have a right posture for the younger population to do not land up with early degeneration. Just to give you an example, we as surgeons who operate in constantly in this position also are prone to this sort of a problem. So in spite of we being doctors, in spite of we knowing still we can have this trouble because it's a occupational hazard. So, so is the occupational hazard of all the people working from home on their laptop. So that's... Yeah. 
yeah that's uh, that's true and uh, for a layman you know what dr nagraj also meant was the rotator cuff these are the the muscles uh, which are uh, the shoulder muscles okay and uh, as uh, you uh, the elderly as he said very nicely that even if they get a tear of this muscle the rotator cuff you know you might not know it initially okay there is a gradual process going on of degeneration which happens and one day all of a sudden while doing something overhead you might feel oh i am in back pain why it happened to me all of a sudden i was all you know i was fine throughout all this time i was okay why this happened to me if anything like this happens please do go and take uh, the uh, you know uh, help of the medical professional and do go and get it checked as soon as possible do not ignore any kind of pain in the body even at this time people are available online and you can at any time you know whosoever is uh, there you can take tele consultation with them and uh, you know get it addressed as soon as possible yeah so yes very uh, common uh, lee these days as dr nagraj had just spoken about uh, right now the people uh, who are working on their laptops for long time and who are drooping uh, their shoulders and all so uh, so this this is uh, actually i had thought of asking you another question uh, uh, in the sense also uh, how much do you think is the current lifestyle responsible as one of the things you spoke is you know people are working on the laptops and all for a long time and uh, do you think the uh, number of cases of shoulder pain has increased in this era where people uh, are uh, you know maybe because of occupation not able to take care of the posture or you know uh, uh, the changes in the lifestyle w what is your saying that one half i think you have already spoken uh, to us about it yes so we have to understand that yes so answer your question in this era uh, not just because of the present lockdown and work from home in general we are seeing lot of problems related to this era as in the modern lifestyle So the very fact that all of us are on the mobile phone very often, most of the times, uh, the fact that we are on the couch, so we are either on a chair, we are either on a couch, we are either on the sofa, we are either traveling, sitting. So everything that what human being is not supposed to do, we are doing in this modern era. So what happens with this is that the upright posture which our ancestors were always used to, upright posture when related to farming or when related to you know walking across or when even sitting on the floor and sitting upright and eating the the body has suffered uh, in this modern era so what happens is that if a person is crouching constantly which happens in a chair it's the upper back the lower back that starts getting affected first once that happens you start keep starting working uh, on the table without understanding that your elbows have to be supported this is a common advice but lot of people are not aware and they will work from different postures the laptop could be taken to any portion of the room people work from the sofa or from the bed again uh, crouching so it's very important like a um, uh, few people are aware that, that you need to have the right posture keep the elbow supported both the shoulder should be upright the back should be upright and make sure that every half an hour or so you make you take a walk for about 5 minutes so that you can make sure that your spine is used to being upright many times a day these are the these are the uh, important things to understand and of course in the exercises whatever exercise lifestyle people are following it's important that core muscle strengthening which involves the central portion of your body is uh, strengthened properly whatever advice is told to you by your trainers by your uh, physiotherapists follow the technical po points very correctly every time whatever exercises you do your elbow your wrist your your uh, shoulder should be in the same plane if there is a difference in the plane you are likely to stress one of the joints more and therefore pain can develop so lot of these technical advices will be told to you by your uh, trained specialists follow those technical advices to prevent injury yeah very uh, right so very true uh, there are uh, uh, you know uh, many times when people approach to uh, physios okay uh, they uh, they many times they ask for it even you know if you could just give an ultrasound or a tens uh, which is not the thing you know these days they, it, it is so much there is so much of advancement uh, there are there's so many things happening and uh, we have seen people recovering from long standing pains with the correct uh, 
form of exercise or uh, you know movement control which is happening these days so uh, we just need to know uh, how we are approaching and you know whether we are getting those things done for us or not so that we can gain a lot benefit out of this whole uh, thing yes uh, uh, there is a uh, like you know the shoulder pain uh, like for frozen shoulder for example we know that uh, people suffering from frozen shoulder take a long time to recover 9 to 12 months and uh, you know uh, but if we not just consider frozen shoulder there are uh, many many diagnoses which are associated with the shoulder pain uh, and uh, you know different kind of tears or are uh, based on the age also like uh, which population are we uh, looking at a uh, young athlete or uh, an old person maybe with a degenerative tear okay so so we have varied uh, labels diagnostic labels which are there uh, but in general for people to understand it uh, the, i think you would have uh, told about the exercise part for the full recovery you know for the full recovery of a patient to come out of this soon uh, what are your uh, what is your call on exercise and uh, uh, even one more thing which people are very very uh, conscious about these days or being told about uh, these days is uh, their vitamin levels yeah uh, the vitamin b3s or uh, you know d3s and b12s so for a complete recovery or a faster recovery okay what are the things you consider in your clinical practice you know what are the things you feel that if, you know i should be taking care of these things so that the patient gets maximum benefit out of it so uh, there are various parts to this question now let us say with respect to age uh, to summarize for the general population classic frozen shoulder which is painful and stiff shoulder in the absence of any mechanical problem in your shoulder this classic frozen shoulder is typically not seen in youngsters it is seen in the fourth decade and the fifth decade typically or maybe in the end of the third decade so 35 to 50 55 is the classic age group so a young person is very very anybody less than 30 is very unlikely to have classic frozen shoulder unless obviously he has got a endocranial problem coming to the association of painful uh shoulder conditions and stiffness yes if a person which especially somebody who is a gym goer has not been guided properly in terms of how he should strengthen not just the front group of muscles but also the back group of muscles then he will gradually have tightness of the front structures and weakness of the back structures and then because of that they will start developing shoulder impingement damages and can land up with pain and stiffness so that's a different uh entity in the younger population in terms of uh, uh, vitamin d3 vitamin d3 as you know is a generalized problem it's not something related only to the shoulder so if somebody has got vitamin d3 deficiency which is very common 8 out of 10 people today have the deficiency it will affect every joint every muscle every portion of the body uh, in terms of uh, easy fatigability in terms of inability to recover from minor injuries so if there's a minor injury in a young age let us say there's a small rotator cuff injury you likely to recover with some medicines and rest but if there is a deficiency then your recovery becomes slow so that's how vitamin d3 will affect even the shoulder i hope you have i've answered your questions anything okay. um, let me know yes sorry yes yes i i uh, these were the questions we which we thought we should be we would be discussing and you know we could give some insight to a common man about yeah. the problems they face generally or uh, you know some kind of precautions which they can take right now uh, this half an hour is too less for actually yeah. tell uh, you know to tell everyone everything right now uh, yeah. but uh, we had tried if we could cover a few things uh if you uh, have any questions this is out for a common man uh, you know the general population the non medical people if you have any questions right now you could ask us and uh, we would be happy to uh, okay, answer yeah. there is one question we can take that and then we can shift to the physiotherapist in the group yes the sir. question is that whether the drooping shoulders in a patient can be corrected permanently if you are constantly aware of the right posture yeah, yeah. yes it can be corrected permanently especially if you have you do not have any spine related issues as in you don't have osteoporotic injuries to your spinal column which is leading to a kyphotic posture if that is not the case you have a normal spine it's a muscular and a biomechanical issue it can be corrected permanently 
and uh, last thing is for the general population uh, uh, whenever you have shoulder trouble it's important to uh, have a thorough biomechanical evaluation by your specialist and not just go for modalities i think these are the two take home messages which i wanted to give you want to take these questions now there are a couple of questions coming from uh, you can see on the chat box i think one is from a doctor dr avni so that we can take up later yeah from the general people how to properly diagnose shoulder radiculopathy and how to reduce muscle knots on the shoulder do you want to take any of them from your perspective then i can tell my perspective uh yeah uh, sir you please go ahead uh, with it right now i'll add on to it yeah so how to properly diagnose shoulder radiculopathy now there is nothing like shoulder radiculopathy uh, you usually have what is called as an radiculopathy in the upper limb or the lower limb now radiculopathy classic radiculopathy starts from the neck and then goes all the way to the uh, wrists and the fingers that's usually related to your nerves getting pinched in the neck we are not discussing that problem today what commonly happens in a shoulder issue is because of prolonged weakness the, the 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 limb itself becomes the muscles around the shoulder become so weak that the body cannot take the load of that particular limb and that manifests in the form of a weakness or a vague sensation which the patients might call as radiculopathy so the neck will be normal so the the specialist like us will check the neck will make sure it is not coming from any pinched nerves we will look for specific group of muscles we will examine every group of group of muscle and then we'll be able to say that this is a long standing wrong posture and a biomechanical issue so therefore we will go into we are going to strengthen the particular group of muscles many of these patients also have deficiency of vitamin d3 and b12 as dr priyan mentioned so we correct those also so biomechanical corrections metabolic corrections posture advice ergonomic changes in the work environment all these are uh, necessary to treat you of this so called shoulder radiculopathy one more general doubt is can rounded shoulders be a reason for shoulder pain can rounded shoulders be a reason for shoulder pain i'm not very clear by what they what she means by rounded shoulders uh, i think so they what they mean is the rounded uh, you know the the protracted shoulders which we uh, usually uh, see that okay. is i think that is what they uh, yes i think that is the most common reason we are seeing shoulder pathology in the present population because protracted shoulder effectively means that the shoulder retractors are very weak and the scapula this is a bone at the back of your shoulder which is responsible which is like a pivot so if the scapula is in the right position all the shoulder girdle muscles are in the right position so the minute the scapula is weak the shoulder starts drooping and getting a rounded appearance so yes it is a very important reason for shoulder pain and a good specialist will check each and every group of muscle at the back and correct them in the right way to relieve you of your shoulder pain yeah uh should i add on uh, yes, so please, one yes, of please. the uh, question which is there about the knots on uh, shoulder uh, so see one thing which in my clinical practice i have been seeing uh, people coming uh, with uh, the pain here in the nape of neck you know this is called as nape of neck and uh, for all the uh, from, uh, people who are listening to us and uh, the pain in here can be from the neck it can be from the shoulder as well okay we we have to uh, assess it and then decide from where it is coming first of all is this the muscles around the shoulder if you say per se there are uh, not only muscles around in here but there are muscles which control the shoulder from the ba upper back as dr nagar shetty had already spoken so you know there is a uh, what do we call as shoulder girdle muscles so this whole is a girdle okay so this whole is a shoulder girdle and we have lot many muscles on the upper back too yes many times when people have this radiating pain you know sometimes you know they say oh my pain is coming from my neck and it's there going to the arm and i'm not able to get relieving posture sir has already has described what cervical radiculopathy yes definitely we have to rule it out one of the very important things to rule out um apart from that many times we have seen in our clinical practice people with the knots or tightness in few of the muscles so there are knots which develop in the few of the muscles okay these are called as trigger points which we commonly call as in the medical terminology and they do give people a radiating pain so it mimics the radiculopathy also so we have to be uh, really careful in our assessment to find out if it's just a muscle knot which is giving you this trouble or is it coming from your neck or your neck you know some nerve is getting pressed so uh, and many times it's not the nerve which is getting pressed it's just the muscle 
uh, knot which you are saying, a trigger point which is there, uh, which gives you so much of problem and relieving it well. But there has to be a good assessment of it. We cannot be, uh, you know, uh, leaving the cervical part as such we have to be very sure that the neck is not involved in it only when you are completely sure that the neck is not involved in it and it is coming from the knots then only to go ahead with it that releasing of the trigger points will help you yeah so to reduce the knots your question was how to reduce the knots so this is a particularly a uh, technical thing okay i would say do not reduce on it on your own until and unless you are being taught to okay so uh, physiotherapists have a way of doing it and uh, there are certain uh, particular areas which they are quite aware of where the point is located and in which muscle it is located and that is how there are techniques to release those muscles you know to get maximum benefit out of it if you're not able to go to someone then i would say just take just learn it in the right way to do it on your own and uh, uh, definitely uh, some people respond well to hot uh, hot packs okay uh, if you're not able to do anything else just taking a hot pack over you know those particular knots helps to increase the blood circulation over there and helps to release it to some extent not not that it will be completely released but you can get some amount of benefit out of it and uh, few people we have seen that few people respond well to cold this is very very subjective okay this is very very subjective few people just don't like cold at all they they feel like if a cold pack is being put they feel oh my pain is really increasing okay so that is individual it differs from individual to individual we just cannot generalize it but yes uh, uh advice is always better if you are talking in terms of knots and releasing it it's always better to get uh, an advice on how to do it and then maybe you could do it at home uh, uh, I'm just checking on if you have uh, got other questions which uh, which we could uh, address in here. Most of the questions are from uh, physiotherapists, uh, from technical point of view. So we can take it after our session. Okay. Okay, I hope uh, we have been able to answer you all over in here. And if there is something uh, which you feel uh, you have, uh, you know, still want to uh, get answers or get aware about it, you could drop in us a mail on insighttutorial.gmail.com also and uh, on Dr. Nagra Shetty's email ID as well. And uh, uh, yes, we are there. If, if, if needed be, uh, we can, uh, you know, take another webinar as in part two for the same thing so that more awareness is created. And if you have missed out on something, we could help everyone out there. Yeah. So as in uh, now the second, uh, sir, shall we start the second part? Yes, please. Yeah, so as in now, uh, we will be starting the second half of this conversation where we'll be uh, talking to the medical fraternity and uh, Dr. Nagraj would be sharing his knowledge, the current, uh, the current concepts uh, related to the shoulder uh, problems and, uh, you know, uh, different, different uh, kind of x-ray views and all. And uh, it would be more uh, technical stuff and it would be more of medical terminologies, which, which uh, we'll be using. So if uh, common man and uh, general population, non-medical people. If you want to leave at this time, you may do so. Uh, this will all be a uh, technical stuff which will be going on. So uh, thank you so much uh, to uh, the for the first half for joining in. Let us begin with the second half of our uh, this uh, webinar. So uh, off to you, Dr. Nagraj, for sharing the webinar with the, all the medical fraternity. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Priyank. So uh, what we thought was. Uh, there's a lot of confusion related to stiff shoulder. So how do you how do you go about evaluating a painful and a stiff shoulder? I thought I will share my tips and tricks because uh, uh, what is what is exactly a frozen shoulder? What is exactly a stiff shoulder? Uh, remains a matter of confusion even to a lot of uh, trained orthopedic surgeons. And uh, these sort of uh, uh, tips and tricks uh, will make your life easy. So this is my profile. I'm a practicing arthroscopy shoulder and knee surgeon at Leelawati Hospital, Nanavati Hospital and Hinduja Khar. I'm also the head of department at uh, Kandivli Shatabdi uh, General, Municipal General Hospital. So with this dedicated practice uh, that I'm having for the last uh, almost 12 to 15 years, I have developed some tips and tricks to manage this common shoulder problem that I'm going to share with all of you. 
So the first thing is before we un before we know how to treat something, we need to know how to define it. So that's what we are going to do. Define what's a classic frozen shoulder and how it differs from other painful and stiff shoulder conditions. We'll discuss the relevant anatomy. And there is an importance, probably two slides, which I'm going to share with you, which has made a difference in my understanding as a surgeon. And I'm sure it will add value to your practices. How do you assess them? And whether uh, they need any procedures or they can manage or they can be managed conservatively. So I'm going to stick to the conservative management because surgery for frozen shoulder is something that we do very, very rarely. And that obviously will, I will not stop. So how do you define a classic frozen shoulder? It's a condition of uncertain cause. So idiopathic in nature, there is no existent cause for it. Uh, it is characterized by spontaneous onset of pain. More, more important than this is the second part of the definition for me. In a classic frozen shoulder, there is a significant global restriction. So global means all the movements of the shoulder, which is forward flexion, abduction, external rotation, external rotation with arm by the side, and internal rotation. So global restriction of all shoulder movements, both active and passive parts of it, in both the supine and the standing position. Now, why each part of this definition is important? Uh, global restriction, if it is there, it almost always confirms our uh, diagnosis of a frozen shoulder, especially if the active, that is 90 degrees active, and you can't take it passive further, then it is definitely frozen shoulder. Why it's important to put the patient in the supine position also? Because sometimes if the scapula is not stabilized, because of uh, unstable scapula, you can have a restriction of movement. So if the shoulder restriction matches in the uh, standing and in the supine position, then you can diagnose it as a frozen shoulder. There can be variations. Sometimes a patient who comes to you in the early phase of frozen shoulder might have a good forward flexion and typically they have restricted uh, rotation. So rotations are the first to be affected in frozen shoulder. With this definition, uh, this is a nice chart which tells us that the, the, uh, the stiffness around the shoulder when it is primary without any mechanical damage is when we call it as adhesive capsulitis, periarthritis or frozen shoulder. But let us stick to the terminology frozen shoulder. It basically means idiopathic stiffness. If there is a secondary cause, like for example, anything related to the rotator cuff, either in the form of a swelling within the cuff when we call it tendinitis, either related to degeneration when we call it tendinosis, either related to pinching of it where there can be mild tears called partial tears, or complete tears. All of these reasons are important pain generators which the pain, shoulder can respond with stiffness and therefore it's a secondary stiffness. And then you need to know about tertiary stiffness that is because of trauma, either a small fracture or if there is a surgery done around the shoulder or we need to import, importantly remember if there is a wrist fracture wherein a plaster has been put or a surgery has been done, there is something called the hand syndrome where there can be secondary ter tertiary stiffness, uh, which is called as a shoulder hand syndrome. So these are the various causes for stiffness. We are just discussing the primary uh, stiffness uh, of the shoulder. Now, what's the relevant important anatomy? We need to understand that the shoulder girdle, especially the anterior portion has got four layers. The layer one and the layer two is nothing but the capsule and the thickening of the capsule, which is called as the glenohumeral ligaments. And these glenohumeral ligaments are important because the contractures of these cause specific restrictions of movement. So that's how the anterior capsule is very important for us. This is the deeper layer, the layer which is corresponding to the bone that is the coracoid. So the coracohumeral ligament and the relevance of it in restriction because it is intricately linked to the glenohumeral ligaments, intricately linked to the rotator cuff and a contracture of the coracohumeral ligament is the one that is responsible for restriction of external rotation especially. So this is the image that I was trying to tell you. So as you can see here in this image, you have the coracoid on top. You have the coracohumeral ligament there at the base of the coracoid. And then you've got the thickening of the capsule on the superior portion called as superior glenohumeral ligament. In the middle portion called as middle glenohumeral ligament. In the inferior portion called as inferior glenohumeral ligament. Now what's the importance of this? Let's take the two superior structures, the coracohumeral ligament and the superior glenohumeral ligament. They form the floor of what is called as a rotator interval. It's called the rotator interval because it's present between the two rotator cuff muscles that the subscapularis in the front and the supraspinatus at the back. There is an interval between the two where there's only 
capsule and that is basically formed by these two structures the coracohumeral ligament and the superior glenohumeral humeral ligament now if this contracts if the rotator interval shrinks there is restriction of external rotation with arm by the side so if you want to treat a patient either surgically or uh, even by in terms of rehab if you want to stretch out the rotator interval then you need to realize that that is because external rotation with arm by the side is corresponding to this tightness as you come to the middle glenohumeral ligament it is slightly responsible for restriction with the arm as it goes into abduction and when the arm goes into say 90 degree abduction it is the inferior capsule which actually has contracted and causing restriction in abduction so that's this this is the importance of understanding the layers of the anterior capsule if we talk about the posterior capsule if there is a tightness of the posterior capsule it typically will restrict internal rotation so anybody especially the throwing athletes when we see them they have specific restriction of internal rotation called as internal rotation deficit the glenohumeral internal rotation deficit that happens because the posterior capsule is tight so this is how the shoulder capsule and the thickening of the capsule contractures cause specific restriction of movements and that's why i like this image a lot so this is what i summarized just now so if there is an ighl contracture there will be restriction of abduction and forward elevation rotator interval contracture will cause restriction of external rotation posterior capsule contracture or tightness will cause restriction of internal rotation so that's the summary this is a very nice slide from this is this this uh, gentleman is considered to be the grandfather of shoulder surgery he is the one who identified way back in the 60s and 70s the importance of the coracohumeral ligament which is the important structure responsible for restriction of external rotation especially this is what i was trying to say typically around in the in the third in the fourth and the fifth decade you see the uh, classic frozen shoulder patients uh, females are likely more predisposed to this than males pre existing disorders like uh, diabetes thyroid autoimmune disorders are responsible basically there is a shrinking of the joint capsule in frozen shoulder and there is a primary inflammatory response so if a patient comes in that inflammatory response they are the ones who are extremely painful and you'll see examples of these so this is a histopathological correlation when the patient comes to you in the first 3 months if it uh, which this is where they classically come to you there is predominantly pain even the slight touch or even the slight examination is going to cause excruciating pain to them they have night pain they are unable to sleep this is the so called freezing phase where everything is very inflamed inside the shoulder gradually there is a synovitis response there is a hypertrophic synovitis response which leads to the thickening of the capsule and the pain starts coming down and the stiffness starts increasing that's the uh, second phase and then there is a significant stiffness and the pain goes down that is the phase 3 or the frozen phase so what we need to understand is that the patient might point out a minor traumatic event they would say ki i had a small jerk and then it worsened but that's just a predisposing factor that's not the cause for it and typically the patient may not come to you with global restriction of all movements they typically come to you with restriction of only rotations initially and then the other movements start getting affected you will obviously investigate them now this is the important thing that i want you to see you should get a plain x ray done before you diagnose them you need not get a mri done in these cases you need to however get a plain x ray done because you will see examples of arthritic shoulders you will see an x ray of a patient who actually had shoulder arthritis and was continuously being managed as a frozen shoulder patient with stretching with lot of modalities and with excruciating pain and a simple x ray diagnosed that the patient actually had shoulder arthritis what you also see in this x ray is that the humeral head is slightly higher than the glenoid if you see this on a plain x ray this is called as the superior escape of the humeral head it basically says that the rotator cuff which is a humeral head depressor is either damaged or extremely weak so this tells us that this patient has primarily a rotator cuff pathology and then secondarily stiff and this is the arthritic patient that i told you who was roaming around with a frozen shoulder diagnosis for almost 6 months before she actually knew what was wrong with her so a plain x ray is something that we have to get it done before we label somebody as a frozen shoulder patient mri occasionally is done and it will show that the normal joint fluid uh, pouch that we are seeing on the left hand side disappears because of the shrunken shoulder capsule and you get a thickened uh, glenohumeral ligament complex this is the important uh, few videos that i want you to see as you can see here we are going to check the first movement which is the forward flexion movement 
So all of you should observe. The first part of the movement is active. Active as in what the patient can do. On the left hand side, he's going 180. On the right hand side, he's going only about 100 degrees. Now the second part is ask him to do actively and then you further take it passively. Now observe carefully from 100 degree, I could further take him up by almost 20, 30, 40 degrees. So his active and passive don't match. So his passive movement is more than the active movement. Remember this image. Similarly with external rotation, the next movement is external rotation is arm by side. He's got about 45, 50 degree on the normal side. But when I take it passively, that's an active movement on the right side, but passive further, he goes to almost 55, 60 degree. However, with pain, he is stiff, but the active and the passive don't match. The passive is more than the active. The jerk test, he's, he's quite comfortable with the jerk test. He's not so excruciatingly painful. Then you want to check the uh, external rotation in the abducted position with the spinous process level. So that is at the C7 level. And the last thing is the internal rotation. Ask him to take it actively and then you take it passively. And then you match it to the spinous process level. In this case, it's about D12 L1. You obviously do the rotator cuff examination. That's the empty can strength, the external rotation strength, the, the lag signs that you will see, the ability to hold the arm in external rotation. There's not much of a lag in this. This is all for the rotator cuff examination. This is for the subscapularis called as a belly press. This is not part of our discussion today, but just quickly completing the examination. And this is how my final impressions will come. Uh, that this patient uh, has got weakness. He's got uh, inability to lift beyond 90 degree. His active movement in forward flexion is about 90. His passive is about 110. So there's a difference. And on the x-ray, I see a escape. I see that the humeral head is uh, uh, escaping superiorly. So this tells me that this patient is most likely going to have a rotator cuff pathology, unlike what you will see now. So that's his x-ray. Unlike what you will see now, a correspondingly different patient who's come to me in the freezing phase. So this gentleman is on the left-hand side whom you just saw. Just as a summary, his active and passive don't match. So further passive is possible. However, this lady, you can see her active movements is about 45, 50 degrees, she's excruciatingly painful and there is no further passive movement. So active and passive are equal. So that is your classic frozen shoulder in the early phase. And if a patient comes to you in the frozen phase, like this lady on the right hand side, that's her active movement. She comes to about 90, but further passive is not possible. So that's the classic indicator of a frozen shoulder where active and passive movements match. And the jerk test is seen only in the early phases. It's not seen in the later phases. So the patient will not allow you to examine. And that's the classic early phase. But the, the, this need not be the presentation. They might come to you in the later phases also. I typically put them on some steroids and, uh, and then we put them on a very uh, focused passive stretching program where the scapular stabilization is focused on first and then each range of motion is worked upon. Uh, we do give them steroids orally and by intra-articular uh, way. And this is the surgical part which I'll not get into as far as today's discussion is concerned. So this is my take-home message uh, for all our colleagues is that frozen shoulder is a diagnosis reserved for global restriction of both active and passive movements uh, in the absence of any pre-existent shoulder pathology. Uh, before before we uh, take the discussion ahead, Dr. Priyank, shall I show the X-ray positioning also? Yes, sir, definitely. Yeah. And then only if time permits, we will take up anything else. Otherwise, just want to quickly go through these three slides. Sure. So I hope you can see this uh, slide. So this is how if you, if any of you, and I want you all my colleagues here to understand this because many patients will primarily come to you. And today the take home message is you're not going to diagnose a patient as a frozen shoulder without an x-ray. And most of you do prescribe x-rays, MRIs to understand what is uh, going wrong with the patient. Now, this is how a typical x-ray is taken. This is taken at a reputed corporate tertiary hospital in Mumbai. 
I obviously won't name the hospital, but this is the normal, this is the technician how he takes this. I told him to just take it as to how he's been taught. Okay, ma'am. So this is how he positions the patient and this is how the x-ray looks. You can see there is an overlap between the humeral head and the glenoid. This doesn't give us any information. It doesn't uh, tell us about the gothic arch. I'm sorry is. for interrupting you, sir. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. We are facing some technical issue while we are going on YouTube live. I guess people are facing a difficulty on your YouTube live. Are We are on there, right? One second. It's, it's showing uh, we are live here. Uh, yeah, because I got a few messages. Uh, mm. I'm also checking once. It's showing video playback interrupted. <laughs> I'll stop it and start it again. Yeah. I think we are live now. Okay. So shall I go ahead with the... Yes, sir. Just let me know if you can see the screen, please. Yes, yeah, sir. It is visible. So this is how the plain x-ray is taken. It's an inappropriate AP view because you can see that the humerus and the glenoid are overlapping each other. This doesn't give me an idea of the joint line doesn't give me an idea of the uh, exact position of the humeral head in relation to the glenoid. And this is an absolutely inappropriate view, which, which hides a lot of information. How do you take a true AP view, which, which is what basically gives you the maximum information? So you need to turn the patient towards the cassette because as you know, the scapula is at about a 30 degree angle to the chest wall. You need to negate this effect of the scapula. So you need to turn the patient in such a way that he is uh, facing towards the uh, cassette. So this patient, the, the point of the shoulder is now turned towards the cassette. So the scapula is now parallel to this cassette. The x-ray beam is directed towards the coracoid process and you can see the entire joint in its profile. And you can see that the humeral head is slightly elevated compared to the glenoid. And that gives you the understanding that this patient actually has a rotator cuff, just a rotator cuff uh, tendinosis actually. He doesn't even have a tear. But so much information I've got from his true AP x-ray. So that's the positioning. X-ray beam should be positioned in such a way that the, X the beam is going tangential to the coracoid. The arm is in neutral rotation and the patient is turned towards the cassette. So that's a true AP view. That's an axillary lateral view, which gives us again information if there's any joint space narrowing, which is very common in heavy bench pressers. And even we see this joint space narrowing in early arthritis in the age group of even 35 odd patients. So that's how we get an axillary lateral. So a true AP, uh, axillary lateral, and if there's any injury to the shoulder, if the patient is unable to take it into the abducted position, then you can do this velpo axillary lateral, where effectively you keep a cushion under the elbow. The X-ray beam is shifted in such a way that it is tilted towards the axilla and the cassette comes on top. So wherever you all are practicing, you all have to ask the X-ray technicians to be trained enough to do these views. You can do the scapular Y view, which gives you about the uh, profile of the acromion. So that's how the Y view is taken. All this information is available on various websites, but still we don't do, still do not have technicians who know these uh, views and how they are to be taken. So that's how we take the Y view, which gives us the entire profile of the acromion, and it tells us if there is any subluxation of the humeral head anteriorly or posteriorly. So that's uh, the couple of things that I wanted to show. We can take the discussion uh, ahead now. Yeah. Sir, I, uh, is it over from your side? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fine. I think uh, 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 that is what we had wanted to discuss. And uh, because of some technical issues and errors, uh, there were some problems for people to join in on uh, us on uh, Zoom and uh, YouTube. Uh, we have a recording of it. 
and uh, we will be uploading it on YouTube uh, as well again. And uh, we'll see, uh, sir, uh, after your concern, after discussing with you, if we could uh, make it happen again or, you know, in a different way so that who have not been able to join us today for this sudden technical error, maybe uh, we could uh, reschedule it sometime that uh, we can discuss later but uh, yes as of now we had uh, this thing uh, for today and uh, if you have any technical questions to all the uh, people in the medical fraternity who are listening to this if you have any doubts uh, we will be addressing it right now there is dr avni's questions she's been holding it on for some time yeah uh, i'll answer the uh, rotator cuff question first so she's asked uh, can you put light on rotator cuff tears? What is the classification for a patient to undergo surgery or be managed conservatively? I think that's a very good question. Uh, rotate, once you have diagnosed a patient with a complete rotator cuff tear, only then the question, almost always, only then the question of surgery versus conservative actually comes. I would say 9 out of 10 partial rotator cuff tears can be managed conservatively. So that's the first take-home message. So if you see that the patient has a partial rotator cuff tear and he's been advised surgery, then uh, we need to evaluate it further, whether actually it's those 1% cases or not. Now, if it's a complete rotator cuff tear, what are the criteria we uh, take it further? Now, imagine there is a traumatic rotator cuff tear. Somebody has fallen down. The patient is having what is called a pseudo paralysis. They can't lift the shoulder at all. So this is the category where it's an absolutely clear category. There is no way this patient is going to do well without surgery because the rotator cuff is completely torn and day by day it is getting retracted and getting completely weaker. So this is a surgical emergency practically. A patient who has got pseudo paralysis and a complete rotator cuff tear. Uh, a person who is having some function but extremely weak and a traumatic tear, again there is no doubt in our minds this uh, needs to be repaired. The question comes when a patient comes to you with a complete rotator cuff tear and within a few days, with some anti-inflammatory, they are having full function. They are having excellent pain relief. So this is the category of patient where there is uh, a role of uh, continuing them conservatively and uh, counseling them what are the pros and cons of continuing the conservative treatment. So if a person has a complete rotator cuff tear but good function is in the 55-60 year old age group where there is a dominant arm affection and they are still active they run the risk that in future, say in six months, one year, two years, whenever they decompensate, whenever their strength goes down or the pain worsens, the rotator cuff will undergo what is called as fatty infiltration. Fat will infiltrate into the muscle and the muscle will get wasted and the surgical outcomes will be poor. So this is the counseling that you need to do to them. You need to see them on serial visits at six months intervals to make sure that they are doing well with MRI confirmation that the muscle is not getting wasted. And then you can continue that uh, conservative treatment in that category of patient. If it's an elderly, if it's 65, 70 age group where they are uh, having a massive rotator cuff tear, uh, conservative treatment has failed, the cuff is not reparable, then you obviously have the option and they are developing arthritis, then you obviously have the option of giving them a reverse shoulder replacement surgery. So uh, the take home message is uh, rotator cuff, if it's traumatic and with significant uh, weakness, surgery. Rotator cuff, it is traumatic uh, with uh, moderate weakness and pain. Uh, again, surgery. Good function, responding very well to conservative treatment. We continue the conservative treatment, even if it's a complete tear, with the uh, regular follow-ups. Okay, uh, we have few more questions, sir. Uh, uh, X-ray you have uh, taken up, right? Yeah, there's one question on X-ray there last. Yeah. What signs to signs note? Signs to note in axillary, yeah. So the main reason we get the axillary lateral view is to see the joint space. So if you have a patient with uh, early arthritis, uh, you will you will see the joint space narrowing very well on the axillary lateral view. Obviously, it also helps in case of uh, patient with instability. But then we will not talk about that now. People who have got recurrent dislocation will have a blunting of their anterior glenoid, which tells us there is a bone loss. 
Uh, it also helps us in case, cases of arthritis because it shows the subluxation. Typical glenohumeral arthritis will have a posterior, mild posterior subluxation, which is picked up on the axillary lateral view. A simple, good, take, a well taken X ray will, will, will differentiate a gleno, early glenohumeral arthritis from other painful causes of shoulder. So, that is, I would say, the most important uh, reason in today's discussion. There are, as per the pathology, the axillary lateral can help you, like I told you, in instability, it will help you for other reasons. Even in case of calcific tendinitis, uh, the calcium mass in relation to the acromion, whether it is anterior, middle, it will give us the location of the calcium mass. So, as the pathology changes, the axillary lateral view can benefit in different views. But in today's discussion, it is for joint space narrowing and for any subluxation. Uh, yeah, we'll just see if uh, there's any other uh, question which is unanswered right now. Uh, does uh, PA shoulder and frozen shoulder different? The difference between PA and uh, frozen shoulder? Yeah, so I think uh, the talk was uh, exactly to differentiate the two. Uh, it's better to call it one terminology because one of the biggest confusions is everybody is causing call, call, calling it. Some people call it periarthritis. Some people call it frozen shoulder. Some people call it adhesive capsulitis. Uh, when we talk about uh, frozen shoulder, we are talking about idiopathic global stiffness of the shoulder. Whether it is peri whether you call it periarthritis or frozen shoulder, frozen shoulder at least means idiopathic global stiffness of the shoulder. Sometimes Secondary causes of stiffness, we, we call it periarthritis. So let us say somebody's got a rotator cuff tear with stiffness, you might call it as a stiff shoulder or a periarthritic shoulder. But frozen shoulder at least means idiopathic global restriction of movement. Yeah. Uh, there's one more question. Can we lift weights if we have pain in shoulders? So uh, that's like a big question. Like it encompasses so many things. Uh, but so, yes. So we need to we need to understand uh, can lifting weights have pain in the shoulders? No. If it is done systematically, uh, then absolutely. Yes, the question is other way around, sir. I guess. So. Can we lift weights if we have pain in the shoulders? Yeah. Of course not. Of course not. If you have pain in the shoulders, then you need to uh, get yourself diagnosed by your uh, treating doctor as to why you have pain in the shoulder, and though th that particular reason has to be sorted, because otherwise, if you lift weights you will be stressing that tissue further and probably cause irreversible damage. So the minute you have pain in the shoulders, consult your treating doctor, uh, get yourself in touch with specialists who are treating this so that you are not misguided and misdirected and uh, sort it out. And then in fact, uh, Dr. Priyank also will tell you uh, that uh, weights are part of our own strengthening program. So we, we make sure the biomechanical correction happens we then give isometric strengthening. We then give mild resistance strengthening. We also give weight uh, strengthening. And then we allow you to go unmonitored uh, and in the gym and lift weights once you understand the entire biomechanical correction. Yeah, very well said by Dr. Nagraj. Uh, uh, lifting weight is initially, uh, we prohibit people from lifting weight if you are in so much of pain uh, that doing anything is troublesome for you. Yes, initially. And depending on the age too, like you know, if you are over 50s and all, you need to take care if you have double shoulder pain as we had uh, already uh, talked about it, that we need to be really careful about it. Any kind of pain in the body is like an alarm that something is wrong and we need to get it checked. Okay, so definitely later on, you know, in a supervised exercise plan, it is added, but not necessarily the weights are given. There are a lot of other ways to uh, strengthen the shoulder and the shoulder girdle muscles. So weights are, uh, uh, these days we think of them later on, but to develop a good strength of the scapula stabilizers and the shoulder muscles, uh, in the beginning, it might not be needed. Later on, could be added again, all under supervision. Okay, so you have to do all thunder supervision. In the beginning, just uh, don't uh, stop lifting it for a while till you are out of the pain cycle. You know, that you're getting some relief from pain somehow with the medications or, uh, you know, by uh, 
the initial uh, phase of any kind of injury you have to uh, follow these few rules of rest ice and uh, you know uh, resting that part so that the body is the body heals on its own but these are a few uh, things like we are giving a conducive environment for it to heal properly so that we are not coming in way to its healing and we are not uh, you know letting the healing happen properly so uh, i hope the question is answered um I'm just checking if you uh, if we have anything else uh, uh vitamin uh vitamin deficiency is recent times incidence of like a young gym i think you had already uh, taken up this no sir by dr abni the mechanical trauma in young gym goals has increased uh, so the only the only thing which i wanted to point out in young gym goers you know typically what i have seen in these this patient population is uh they typically focus on the cosmetic appearance so they are always having very strong uh, pec major they have very tight pec minor they develop their deltoids very well they develop even the upper shoulder girdles very well but they always have a drooping and a tight posture because their scapular retractors are very weak and then they come with a uh, significant rotator cuff impingement because once the scapula is weak once the shoulder is drooping and protracted they develop overload of the anterior structures the anterior edge of the supraspinatus the longer to the biceps this interval and uh, then they get mris which show some of these pathologies and then some of them have been diagnosed with surgeries and then it takes a lot of convincing to tell them that the problem is not with the impingement and the uh, uh, biceps and the cuff that's a secondary problem primarily it's your uh, biomechanics that has to be corrected so uh, many a times you also give them very focused uh, ultrasound guided injections if they have a biceps pathology along with the scapular stabilization biomechanical corrections and then they get relieved very well that's about the young gym goers of course there can be various other problems in young gym goers because some of them go into heavy bench presses absolutely heavy bench presses which goes unmonitored especially when the elbow goes beyond the body level so there is an abnormal stress that they create on the uh shoulder because of this abnormal posture sometimes they can have a sudden subluxation event which which is so subtle that they have missed uh that it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a subluxation and they actually have labral tears which don't heal so they are doing everything but the minute they allow their body to go beyond a particular point it hurts them so we need to get an mri in such cases to make sure they don't have a labral tear and if it is the case then that needs surgical stabilization before it gets worse enough so that's a big 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 entity a gym goer but these are the two or three important problems uh yeah i think we are done here sir with all the yeah. queries yeah. i i have a request from everyone who is listening to us right now we uh, because of technical issues i think we are having less people on zoom right now with us but yeah. there's a request for everyone to please switch on your video uh, the video thing so that we can all see each other and uh, maybe we can take a snapshot of this uh, whole uh, meeting uh, who all have been able to join us today in here sure all of you can please turn on your video yeah uh, please turn on your video uh, thing and so that we all can uh, look at each other and uh, take a photo of this hi everybody lot of familiar faces <laughs> Somehow shy, I think you should take with whoever is not. <laughs> I know, sir. They are coming up. They are coming up right now. We have to consider the technical issues. We faced a big one right now. <laughs> yeah. I'll take. Uh... one screenshot right now yeah we have few uh, more people i guess so we had now people that that okay uh i think done here sir
Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagra Shetty, for joining us today and uh, for uh, all this enlightening, uh, enlightening talk which you gave us today, for all the knowledge uh, which uh, we could share on this platform. And uh, I hope uh, next time again we will be meeting soon with everyone, uh, uh, soon with a part two of uh, this whole thing. And for all the other people who are listening to us, uh, maybe uh, some amount, uh, some other kind of webinar only uh, to uh, in the layman uh, for their issues uh, also can be so that their issues can be addressed as well. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining in here. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Have a good day. Bye bye. Yes, everybody. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you.